So, anyone actually hear of Gearman before this talk? Probably not. I know, I cheat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Gearman, well, the reason why, one of the main reasons why Gearman was created is because of kitten problems. Uh, so, LiveJournal.com, a big blogging site I'm sure most of you know of, they had a they had some load problems where all their image processing of converting images, um, you know, that users were uploading. In most cases with LiveJournal, it tends to be pictures of kittens. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, mean, I mean, if you look at half the blogs on there, it's just like logs of kitten pictures and like, oh. Do, should we really be supporting this? I mean, is that, should that practice be allowed to continue? I mean, yeah. All kittens. All if there weren't kittens, it would be something else. Yes, yeah, that's true. Kittens are better than some alternatives. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the kittens are actually causing quite a bit of load on the on these uh, frontline servers. Um, I think we need a giggle break. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to convert kittens on there. They have to convert formats from downloaded yeah. formats so, so you into what so they like. You know, so someone takes a picture of their digital camera. It's like a you know, a 10 megapixel picture of their kitten that's, you know, big enough to print a poster, but you want it on your blog, so it needs to be resized to this big. Um, and doing that image conversion can be pretty expensive. When you say resize, you mean uh, it will, like, instead of 10 megapixels on the blog, it will be like, well, 100 megapixels. 100 yeah, pixels. Right, sorry. the Mod yeah. Perl code is sitting there using image magic to yeah, resize it or yeah. do whatever. So, so you have Perl or PHP code that's taking this image, this giant image, running it through image magic or um, GD, spitting out the small image and actually writing that on yeah. disk. Now, when your frontline servers are trying to do everything else that they're doing, you have this giant image come in that can pretty much eat up a CPU for you know a good portion of a second. So they re resample it to that, all of that stuff. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, this was getting pretty expensive for them. So they needed a way to take that work and push it elsewhere. So they could have their frontline servers do what they do best and have a little farm of, you know, kitten image conversion machines. <laughs> <laughs> so, Specialized hardware. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can actually take hardware that's, you know, really fast CPUs, not too much memory <coughs> because, you know, you don't need too much if you're, all your CPUs are busy or, you know, converting kittens. Um, so anyways, they had this need, and eventually some other companies started using it, as I'll show in a, in a little bit, but one of the other pe uh, the other uh, companies using Gearman is Dig, for a lot of their news aggregation. Um, they, you can actually use it for a lot of other things, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, but he said, it's sort of like a giant distributed fork mechanism, um, one way of thinking about it. So with Gearman, I'll sort of just go through this little uh, outline. So like I said, it was started because of Live Journal. Um, Danga Interactive was a software company started by Brad Fitzpatrick. And they made other things like Memcached and MobileFS um, to support pretty much Live Journal initially. And then other people started, they did it all open source. Other started people seeing the software and obviously Memcached has done pretty well. Um, Gearman is one of the lesser known ones. Um, but when people find it, they realize I really need this, or I've actually already written it myself, but sort of in this you know half-ass way that doesn't really work that well. And Gearman is sort of putting some better constraints and APIs around it, so people can um, you know use an open-source project and can contribute back to. Uh, it's an anagram for manager because it just pushes work around. It, it's assigning um, you know work to be done from one place to another, but doesn't actually do anything itself like manager. Um, uh, like I said, Dig is using it. They have a pretty good sized cluster. Um, Yahoo, I don't know what they use it for exactly, but they have a large cluster doing six million jobs a day. Um, I don't know what. Um, <laughs> we don't know anyone who's still using Yahoo, yeah, so the, the, it must the be one, for their finance or something. Yahoo yeah, the, the one guy that I know who is using it, I don't think he actually works at Yahoo no. anymore, and I haven't talked to him for a while. So. What about some M analysis? Each email message you have go through, if they have a, you know, a lot of rules or pattern yeah. matching, that would be something you'd stuff into yep. Gearman and then have it pop out right. and say, is it is it above or below the spam line? Yeah, yeah, do the. Question is, filter. why are people still using Yahoo Mail? Anything you basically, <laughs> anything that you normally do and you inside of your web application that you want to offload, so your web application is responsive, so that you can have the processing that it normally does, you can have Gearman do. 
And we'll, you'll see in a little bit, you can also use it for a uh, queuing system as well, besides just distributed processing. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of questions. Why didn't they use the queuing? What's that? Which makes the question why didn't they use one of the uh, dozen uh, Because it's not, because sometimes you need a synchronous response. Um, you know, there are other queuing systems available, but um, well, you can tell from Danga they were really of the mindset of write everything yourself. Um, and it, it worked out pretty well for them, but. I think at that point, this was in 2004, 2005, as far as good open source queuing systems that are really lightweight, I don't think there was something um, you know, that readily available. Um, there were, most of the queuing systems and distributed processing systems were more geared towards like large clusters and scientific computing, which was not quite the same. It's a very similar problem, but you wanted something at a smaller scale. As you'll see, Gearman is trivial to use. Um, it, the API is, is going to be a you know, much easier to use for your average web developer. So that's where it got started. Um, the original implementation was all in Perl. Um, so, you know, I, I was in Perl programmer. <laughs> you know, I still like Perl, but um, I've been doing C, you know, for most of my career. And um, the project that I initially got interested in, Gearman, um, it was going to be all in C, so I needed a C server. So I rewrote most of it in C. Um, I worked with Brian Aker. He also was involved in the Gearman project. And he had started a rewrite in C. Then I came in and helped him uh, sort of re-architect some of it and finish it up. So what's the, the, the need to have it rewritten in C? The speed? need? Yeah, why is well, yeah, the need? Speed. Um, is this I, a speed issue? Or? Yeah. So, so the Perl version is not very efficient. It's doing a lot of excessive memory copies. Okay. The socket I.O. code is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's within the, the Perl implementation. There was a lot of, uh, and we also wanted to start expanding it in a lot of other ways that we wouldn't have been able to in Perl, um, which you'll see in a little bit. Uh, we've developed a number of new language extensions recently. Uh, the PHP extension, um, myself and Jay Ludke worked on, um, and then the Perl access module, and we've worked a little bit with. <coughs> Did you work out with the Perl access guy? No, unfortunately not. Okay. You, you wanted to, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, In my spare time. Yeah. And then there are some user defined functions, so you can use this within something like Drizzle or MySQL. Um, and Postgres is coming very soon because I'm giving a talk at a, a Postgres day um, in two weeks, so I have to have it done before then. Um, there's also a command line tool, so you can use this from your shell prompt. Um, one of the examples you'll see, you can you know pipe things in and out of Gearman just like you would any other um, command line. There are new protocol additions we've added, um, more priority levels for the queuing part, um, and being able to do some some better tracking of your jobs as well. It's unlike the Perl version, which is a single threaded. Uh, I added all the multi-threading support into the C server and. The Perl server could, you know, push a good few thousand jobs per second. On a eight-core machine with a multi-threaded server, I was able to get it up over um, fifty thousand jobs a second, which is pretty much enough for most loads you're going to find in your average web shop. Uh, persistent queues are added into the C server, so you can <coughs> store your your queues that are being pushed through this inside something like Drizzle or MySQL. Um, and I think there's a flat file implementation and a SQLite implementation that other people are working on right now that will be merged into the trunk soon. And the, the protocol is now pluggable, so there's an HTTP interface on it now. So you can submit a job as a normal web page request. Now, you would persist that so other people can view the queues as, as, the, as, the, as the jobs are moving through the queuing system? Or I mean, yeah. why would it matter how so, you So store? the persistent queue, um, the main reason is the original Perl server and the first version of the C server, everything is stored in memory. That nothing is actually written onto disk. So if your job server had, you know, 500 jobs in the queue and then it crashed and you restarted, those jobs would have been lost. Now you can actually write those things out to disk or some other, you know, there's actually, I think Brian wrote a memcached plugin so it's persistent, so to speak, but at least it's persistent on, on or in memory on other machines. Um, so that way, when the server starts back up, it replays the queue that was either on disk or memcache and repopulates those jobs so they weren't lost. Mm -hmm. This is needed if you have you know, an asynchronous queue and you're just tossing things into it. You want to make sure they run, and if the server crashes, obviously they'll, they'll be lost. Um, 
<coughs> so some of the main reasons why um, Gearman is, you know, why we're pushing so hard with it and, and using this is obviously it's open source. The multi-language support is actually, it was already pretty decent and it's only gotten better since we've um, sort of revived the project. Uh, you're not restricted to a single application model with something like, it's, sometimes it's been compared to it with Hadoop because you can do MapReduce like things. Um, you know, with something like Hadoop, you're restricted into a MapReduce model. You have an API where you write, you know, mapping functions and reduce functions and you push that code out and it runs. With this, you can do MapReduce, but you can also do a queuing system or you can do your own custom like merge sort of algorithms that may not be an exact MapReduce model. It's with the C rewrite, a lot of it, a lot of the client APIs are based on the C library now too, so it's really fast. Um, it's, you'll see it's pretty small and lightweight. There's not a lot of uh, code to, you know, put it into your existing applications, and it's there's no single point of failure. You can set up your Gearman clusters in a way that you know every every uh, every piece of it is going to be redundant in some way. So the real basics is you have a you know, some distributed application. It runs on, um, all communication is on TCP port. You have your client, which is sending jobs into the server, which they can be foreground or background jobs, meaning you either wait for a response back from that job to be run, or you just toss it in and go away, and you just hope it gets run. Um, you have workers that register with the same job servers that do the work, and, and they pull the jobs out of the job server and, you know, perform some work, and can optionally send a response back. Um, to the worker, it doesn't matter if it's a foreground or a background job, it all looks the same. Um, it just depends whether you're sending a result back if it goes back to a client. And then the job server sits in the middle coordinating, um, you know, the client requests and the workers that are available to do the work. They're just tossing the information back and forth. I have another question. So, in the case of, like, converting images for, uh, for the blog site, it would toss an image in with some command line options to say convert this image to you know to a new size. Mm -hmm. at, at the end, would the worker actually take that image and write it into a database entry? Would it do actually the yeah. reporting at the end? I'll actually get into that exact example. Fair I'm going to get back to pins. Okay, bit, so. um, but your your basic stack of your Gearman application is going to look like this, where Gearman is providing all this infrastructure in the middle. So you're just writing a little bit of application code on the client and the worker side. So you can say, here, I want this done, and this is how I actually do the thing down here. <coughs> and all the, um, you know, all the network protocols, everything in between, all the APIs are going to be taken, for you, taken care of for you. Is it a callback, or, um, or do you have to pull on the client? Uh, you can actually do either one. Depends. Uh, there's a, there's a non-blocking interface, so you can um, sort of do whatever way you want. Um, so this is a, a simple blocking client. Uh, this is the PHP code, but the Perl code would look pretty similar. So you create a new client object, you add a server. When you don't have any parameters to your add server call, it adds localhost port 4730. There's some same default values there. And then you say, print out the return of um, the method do reverse with the string hello world. So the first argument into the do function is what is the uh, you know what's the function that you want to run? What's the namespace of the of the plot of the problem? The second argument is um, just arbitrary data that you're sending. In this case, it's a simple string, but there's actually in the protocol a four gigabyte limit, which I suggest you never try to approach that <laughs> on any sane application. But you can shove up to four gigabytes of binary data. So that could be a binary blob that you're pushing through. That could be anything. Yeah. So the the ad server, I mean, assuming you have like other worker servers. Yep. Uh, so you just start adding like four or five of them. Uh, when called do, uh, Gearman, I guess, finds the server without any load and then sends the job to that server. Uh, so so it's actually the job servers that you're looking at. So. Um, there's a slide in a little bit that'll show the architecture, okay. and it'll be a little bit more clear. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that. So the four gigabit, uh, gigabit limit, and there, there are image applications like healthcare and medical imaging that mm -hmm. exceed that. Um, in that case, what you would do, um, which we'll see in an image processing example in a little bit, you you would probably store that image in an external file system because, or it's probably already existing somewhere. And you're not going to be pushing this thing through 
TCP yeah. pipes. You just pass a URL or a file path to it and say the worker can go look there to, to pick up that image. Um, so on the workers, so that's all you have to write on the client. That's that's an entire Gearman application on the client side. That that top bit. <coughs> um, just put some PHP tags around it, and you can run that as is. On the worker side, you create a worker object, add the same set of servers that your client added. In this case, we're just connecting to localhost again. And then you register with the job server saying, I'm able to do the function reverse. And every job that you get for the, for the function named reverse, um, run this function, my reverse function, which is defined below. And then you just go into an infinite loop of working. And it basically blocks waiting for a, a new job to come in. And then we'll run that job with the callback function for you. And the callback function just returns the reverse of the uh, of the workload that was passed into it. In this case, it's going to be a string, um, and you can pick other pieces of information out of the job object in your callback function. But in this case, it's just going to be a string, and we just reverse it. So we actually run this. Um, you can copy and paste those two chunks of code into uh, a couple files. In this case, worker and client.php. The Gearman job server. <coughs> that sits in between is called Gearman D. So you can run that in, in the background. We run the worker code in the background, and then we run the client, and you can see it printed the reverse. And that actually you know, had the client connect to Gearman D, send the job, the worker picked it up, sent the response, and forwarded it back to the client. So any questions on the basics of how this is working? Yeah? Do you have the concept uh, or support the concept of uh, different types of workers? And yeah. Um, like, like for example, if you take uh, Trezo, uh, <coughs> configured with different storage engines, mm -hmm. so you pick up pick uh, workers uh, that you want. Yes. So, so the workers identify themselves with a function name. So depending on what function name you define, you can create your own namespace within your, your application domain of, you know, this function does reverse, this function does, you know, rotate 13, you know, this function does something else. And you can have workers running in different languages even, all connected to the same job server, um, you know, doing that, doing that, uh, you know, that functionality separation, you know, within that name. So. Um, like you were asking about, you know, how does this actually connect together? The clients <coughs> send a request. In this case, the job server, um, we have two of them. And the clients can connect to either job server. And the workers, when they start up, they'll connect to all job servers and wait for jobs um, coming into <coughs> any of them. So if this job server goes away, these clients can just fail over to that job server. If, if this worker dies, um, you know, there's still enough workers. So it's, it's designed with failure in mind that things are going to crash, things are going to die, and you know you'll still build the function after this. So the workers would have to register themselves with as many job servers as they, they, they yeah. want. And yeah. Yeah. If I, I take it, the, the pro, there's a protocol that where the worker does, you know, someone spills coffee on your server, mm -hmm. the job server will resend the job to another. Yep. So so if this worker drops the job and it's running on something. And then if this worker dies, the job server detects the TCP, TCP connection was closed and then had one outstanding job. It'll reschedule that job onto another worker to be done. So if you, if you, need, um, you, know, if you need some consistency there, that's something you handle at the application level of like, making sure things don't get run twice or if something gets run partially, it's not going to be corrupted later on. Um, you know, that's something you can easily handle in your, in your application if you design it the right way. So no in place of editing the files. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just uh, as you'll, I think I mentioned it, one of the big things with this is start thinking about eventually consistent data models when you're writing applications on top of Gearman. So, you know, if you do something here and there, and then, you know, they, like, maybe this only happens part way, or if this gets run twice, it's not going to damage your, your data in, in some way. Or in the case of image processing, it may get processed twice, and that's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, when you're actually using this as a, a mesh to start pushing data through and having storage on the back end, then you have to start thinking about some of those consistency issues. So, um, so how is this useful? So now you have this distributed nervous system to start pushing packets around, and it takes care of a lot of that network overhead for you, um, and mapping onto to different you know sets of machines you know through the worker name. 
you get a natural load balancing. Like a worker is only going to grab work if it's free to do the work. It's not going to, um, you know, grab the job servers and pushing down saying, here, do these 500 things um, while other workers are sitting idle. The job servers will keep them in queue until there's something, um, until there's a worker available. Uh, like I said, we have, you know, a number of languages that are being supported now. As far as distributed processing goes, if you have your storage, um, you know, if you already have your data on some remote machine out there, and you want to process that data on a frontline machine like a web server, actually push that processing to where the data is, so you're not pushing all the data over the pipe. Um, you know, so you can start using some of the ideas of MapReduce of you know the data locality of pushing processing out there into the cluster, and you can use it for asynchronous queues, which we'll see in a little bit. So back to the kittens. Um, like I said, this was the original way, um, that, or I should say the way that most people do image processing inside the PHP script in the web browser, or sorry, in the web server. This is where the resize is happening. What we want to do is to push that out a little bit further. So you have your web server um, <coughs> making the request. The PHP job, maybe it's sending the entire image through Gearman, or it's putting it in a separate storage, like your um, Mentioning of you know using external data store being able to shove a you know an image through that's much larger and you don't want to clog the pipe of gear man. Um, you can store it somewhere and just send a URL or a file reference to it. And then your resize workers are just sitting down there on the bottom, you know, doing the image resizing, either storing the resize image in the same storage and sending a pointer back to it, or send the resize image directly through back to the top level application. Um, the resize worker, um, I use the image magic library. You can see that this top function um, or these top series of methods for the for the worker object are pretty much the same. This time you registered a function resize with my resize function. And down here, every time we get a job, the job is actually the entire binary image that was sent through. We take that, um, pass this into image magic, scale it down to 200 by 150 and then return the scale down image. So in most cases, it's going to be a much smaller image. And we can run this now. Um, we start up the job server, start up the worker in the background. And this is using Gearman as the command line tool. Um, so you can start jobs and send payloads. Anything you pipe into the Gearman tool is the actual payload that gets sent off. Um, so we start up Gearman and we say run the function resize. That's what the dash f argument does. We want to pipe in the large JPEG and the output of that is just going to write the standard output. We pipe that into um, the thumbnail. And you can see after doing this we turn the 3 meg object into a um, 32k thumbnail. And so if you have the Gearman uh, PHP extension and C server installed, and you actually start up this code directly, you'll be able to do this you know, pretty quickly. If you want to write the client in PHP, it would be a simple matter of you know taking that client code and extending it of you know whatever blob you get um, from the web request, just send that off as a gear the payload of the Gearman job instead. Um, kind of like in the Hello World example. So. Anything you wanted to add to the imagery side of the application? Um, well, there's just a, a number of things you can do with this. I mean, it, it's your imagination is the limit to this, whatever you want to take out of your web application and uh, put into the background. This is one of the best ways to do that. <coughs> so often you have this application that has all this logic in it, bogged down and uses a lot of memory and slow. This helps distribute that out. So does each worker have exactly one job that it's doing? You can register multiple functions with a single worker. Like but but it only does one function at a time. Yeah. So it may have four things that it could do, but if it's doing a resize, it's not going to do any of the other functions yeah. while the resize is grinding. Once the resize is done and it says, I'm finished, then it's available to do any of the four other, any of the four yeah. functions. Exactly. And so the basically each worker is either on or it's off. It's on and doing something mm -hmm. or it's off and it can do whatever functions it's registered for. Yep. There, There is actually an advanced worker interface, which I'm not showing just to keep it simple, but you can pull down multiple jobs at the same time then. Um, so if you wanted to do five different things, you could pull down five different jobs and do them concurrently um, if it made sense in your application. Um, 
like if you wanted to write a big multi-threaded um, worker in C, you could actually have a pool of threads that you're dishing the functions out to and have one coordinating thread um, pulling you know, multiple jobs down and pushing them out. But it's a lot more advanced for a basic example. So, Is there an advantage to that over just having no end processes running each of the groups? Yeah, I mean, single function. It's fine to, you know, if you have, say, if you have a 32 core machine and you fire up 32 um, processes of that resize worker, that's probably fine for most cases. There may be certain applications where you need more consistency and, um, you know, communication between your different workers that could be running on the same machine, and having that in a threaded application could make sense. Um, I think well, those are pretty limited use cases, but it is possible to do. Well, if, the, if, if a bunch of workers were all talking to the same database, they could have one database connection open, or maybe a pair of them, for all the for all the workers that are running on that box, as opposed to having each worker having its own database, private database connection. Well, then you'd probably end up with um, resource <coughs> connection that probably makes it run slower. Perhaps. Yeah. But, but there, there are cases where you may want workers sharing some type of resource, mm -hmm. and you would want them in, in the same process. Yeah. So, and but in any case. If somebody finds use for it, you've got to set up for them. Yeah, yeah. And in the libraries, um, even like anything based on the C library, the non blocking interface is exposed too. So if you need to listen on a file descriptor to the database and to Gearman for some reason, you can actually do that um, uh, using a like your own event listening interface too. So there's some other advanced hooks in there. This is just like the simplest example I've shown. Can you pull back the uh, code for working on the uh, the simple one or this one? Uh, the uh, this is simple. Oh, this, this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the um, basically all the workers are just a, a file full of functions where you instantiate a German worker. Mm -hmm. Assuming you have like you know, ten or so things that you want done uh, off your server. Uh, create one file for each. Yep. Is there a way to flag the work? Like, oh, so, so the add function. So you have, to, you have to explicitly add a function in the file of the files that your that worker is in order to add it to the list that it's going to report to the job. The job server? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it won't grab any jobs coming down. Like, it's only going to ask for jobs or be issued jobs that, you know, you explicitly add of what you can do. But if I, if I put this worker on a machine that I really only, this machine's really only good for this one function, mm -hmm. do I have to change my code or is there a way you can flat, is there a, is there an easy way to you know, only put that one worker on that yeah. yeah. Then all the other workers could have a much more elaborate set of functions that they support. Yeah. But you have to edit the file, you have to use a chain and cut out all the functions that yeah, you're not going to use in that. Well, order. actually, yeah, all like you can do is remove the add function calls. I mean, you can have the same file for all of them, but you can say, if if this machine is limited, have some function that says is limited machine, then only do the add function for resize, and if not, then you get to do resize and all this other stuff. I, I get it. So it's only only the functions that they explicitly uh, register. Right. register. So yeah. you can just comment out. Yeah. So, so if you have like an application, um, you know, say if you have a big PHP application with workers in it, you could have a configuration file that you have one config file per machine, and in that config file you say start up this worker and this worker, but not these, yeah. and then you're just going to have a whole like, you know, series of files that you can just blast through and start up the ones that are most appropriate, and that's it. So you can manage all that at the application layer. So I can see how Gearman, as you said before. Um, if it, if it loses a TCP connection, it knows that that worker went away. Mm -hmm. And I assume it will also know if another one established it, that mm -hmm. they can come and go. Yep. yep. So it can balance, or not necessarily low balance, but it, it knows that there's an end number of workers who come and go. Mm -hmm. But what do the clients do as far as the failover? Uh, the clients, if they're connected to a job server, and yeah. they submit a job and say it's waiting in the queue and they're, and they're waiting for it and the job server dies, the client code, mm -hmm. um, if it detects a lost connection, it'll if there are any more job servers, it hasn't attempted to, to connect to yet, it will actually roll over to the next job server that is configured for it. If it only has one job server, then you get an error back saying, you know, hey, I can't, I can't run this job because there are no available job servers. Right, but in the client code that you showed, it just, it, it's, it's very simple. There's, 
it, is that is it above somewhere outside there where it says yeah. here's a list of all the possible places servers you can go connect to and just walk down the list? Yeah, so right here. So yeah. this in this ad server, you could have a list of job servers added right there. Well that's what I was asking. So yeah. when you when you say ads okay. So say if you have three servers that you added to be able to do this function, and the yeah. first one is down or disconnected while you're running it, it would try the next so two. So Gimmer would, would actually do figure out where to go yep. next. And okay. if it can't connect to any of the job servers that you told it to connect to, um, this isn't actually good error handling code, but do would return an error, would return null in this point, and you could check a return code. There's another function saying like, you know, cannot connect to any of the available. So servers. I guess my question though is that, so Gimmer is doing all the failover really. You're just saying, here's all the places yeah. like, I, that I, yeah, the gimmick is running. Yep. Here's a list of servers. Try connecting to, to all of them and run the job on the first one <coughs> you find. Um, and if they all fail, then you'll actually get a return code back saying you could fail. All right. Now, a separate question. So now this does load balancing. So Gimmer is, is act conscious of what all workers are busy and what they're doing and yeah, it, it's a and natural what servers are on, so it distributes the load. Yeah, it, it's sort of a natural load balance, and there's nothing really done explicitly to handle it. Right. it, it if a worker is running doing something, it's not going to ask for more work, unless you have an advanced worker that can handle concurrent jobs. Um, so yeah, it's only going to grab jobs when it's available to do something, so that gives you natural load balance. Yeah? The impression that I get is that you did something fairly clever, which is flip the load balancing problem on its head. Mm -hmm. That rather than keeping track of which workers have which tasks, and therefore I should portion the next job to that one or that one, you said let the workers ask when they are free. The workers ask for a job, which is then given to them, and they get it because they're free. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's the full mark. Yeah. 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 How many workers on how much on what server? What's that? It's more of a just in time system then. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say you had um, more robust like event listeners that you could add on rather than the simple case here? Yeah. Um, so at the C level, um, it's completely abstracted. So internally, there's just a, a poll implementation. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to handle all your own socket IO um, or you know your own like polling system, like say if you wanted to use like libevent or libbb or some, uh, you know, if you wanted to use select like on Windows, which there is a Windows port in the works, um, you could do that if you wanted to. Okay, so this is not going to push back notifications to clients. In other words, your clients are pretty much, you know, like they're gonna they're gonna call the view and then they're wait, going to wait for a return before they can play. Yeah. So th there are actually two interfaces. There's the simple like one job at a time interface, but there's also a concurrent task interface which has callbacks. I didn't show the task interface because it's a bit more complicated, but you can say queue up 100 jobs, shove them all down a single TCP connection, and register these callbacks that get run when any of those come back in any order. And it's a full duplex protocol, so you can you know just do that batch uh, job processing as well. And it'll do it in a non-blocking way. So the do is a, is the block is a yeah. blocking. Yeah, this this is like the simplest way to run a function. There's also the um, there's some tutorials showing the task interface of like queuing up a number of tasks and running them all concurrently and and having callbacks for each. You know, every time a job is created, run this callback. Every time there is an intermediate data payload, run this callback. And every time a job is complete, run this callback. So you, there's a few callbacks you can listen for throughout the life of the job. Funny thing is, this is a hammer, and now I'm starting to look for a nail. <laughs> it's a real nifty hammer. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you, for example, have a bunch of servers, uh, how would you, does this allow you to use all of them in one? Uh, servers for, like, your workers? Machines. Uh, yeah, but, like, use them for all your, your worker code, or... Um, what, what, the, what, how can you, what can you do with it? Jim, Jim, Jim. Like you, you run German D on, on each of them? Okay, um, so what you would usually, let me go back to this one. Um, it it t entirely depends on your application and how redundant <coughs> you want it to be. If you're just testing, you can just, you can run all this on a single machine and it runs just fine. If you have really heavy workers that can eat up an entire machine, you would have a separate machine, um, you know, for each one of these blocks down here, and you probably have 
don't run two job servers on one machine because obviously that's not going to be a very good failover. Um, you know, have these on, running on separate machines. You could run the job server along with one of the workers, or you could run it on the same machine as some of your client machines. You, you can take this architecture and obviously draw more lines and draw your machine boundaries depending on you know, what your application wants to do. Um, that's, that's sort of some of the flexibility. There's no, like, you need a machine dedicated to do this one job, and that's all you can use that machine for. So, yeah? Who's, who, if, you're, if you've got a worker that's actually running more than just worker tasks, maybe it's running some other processes or whatever, yeah. um, it could be, it could have a significantly slower processing time than a performer task than something that's just sitting there idle. Yeah. So you have no, um, you have no uh, resource availability kind of metrics like, yeah, I'm available, but I've only got 30% of my CPU available. Not, not yet. Um, there's actually a project we're just starting. It's a Gearman monitor project where you can run sort of angel processes on every machine in your cluster that monitor like how many workers you have running and what the resources are available. So you can dynamically start and stop more workers. If you see this machine is idle, fire up five more workers. Or this machine is getting really loaded from something else, kill off some of the workers. Um, but that, that type of logic is pushed out to the application to handle. But we've seen enough requests for that type of thing where we're actually starting a project to you know, be able to plug into <coughs> this other system and it can manage it for you. So. Yeah. Um, what kind of performance increases did Live Journal have after they implemented Gearman? I, I can't say. I, I don't really know the exact <laughs> numbers or anything. Um, I know it helped them distribute, you know, their their processing quite a bit um, because they're still running in production today. Yeah. The thing is, that it makes their their user interface more crisp because they're pushing off the image processing off off the web page. I mean, like YouTube. You, dump a, a video onto their site and then they say it'll be available eventually but the click that says we got the file and we're going to start processing comes back <coughs> relatively quickly and then yeah. it goes off into a gear man cluster and disappears for a while and it pops out and there's a hole where the image should be and it says just wait a minute and then you go you know refresh a couple of times you go somewhere else to come back and then it's populated so in, in that respect it's it's not so much that it makes things go faster it makes the interface respond more quickly. It doesn't necessarily make the images come back that much faster. It, it makes the interface long more. Yeah. 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 It, it, it works really well with like Ajax style operations. Yeah. Right. But it also could be yeah. faster because you you know you got a special purpose built machine with the right CPU and memory configuration. Sure. Versus what you need for a web server. It could be very different. Like the image server. Yep. If, if all the workers on a job uh, a job server are filled up or are activating something. And it was the first one the client went to, the client went to the, the job server, all their workers are busy. It knows about another job server that may not have any activity going on. Will it, will the client say, all right, let me check my other job servers, or will no, the first available <coughs> job server just kind of sits on? No, it, it'll sit there because the workers connect to all job servers. So if they go to another job server, they're going to be waiting for the same pool of blocked workers. If you have the yeah, if you register the job, the workers. Yeah, the unless, unless you. That's why when you add the list of job servers for your workers, you usually want to add all the job servers available, so you don't have a starvation problem. The clients only connect to one job server at a time, and yep. then if that one goes away, there's a family. Yeah, but workers will connect listen on all job yeah. on all job servers at the same time. But if you have the job servers running on different uh, server boxes, yeah, that means that uh, and, and workers running on, on all these server boxes means that each one cut. So you, you can have two data movement events yeah. just to get the data back. So yeah, so you can have, end up having a lot of uh, TCP connections on there. Um, and you know, if you have a client, you know, you're going to have a TCP hop to the job server and it's easy to talk to an available worker. So you're going to have, you know, some of that, um, you know, on a low latency network, it's negligible. But yeah, if you're doing this, like, cross data center, it may not make too much sense. How do the different gear and demons know about each other? They don't. They don't need to know the, the about servers, each other. The job like, servers. You don't need to know what I do for a living, but we can come here and share knowledge. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like Memcache. Memcache. Well, yeah, or a cluster pushing money. down or whatever. You do the your job, I do corner. mine, and we report back the results. And yeah. yeah, there's no reason for a job server to know of another one um, until we start doing replication between job servers, in which case they will be configured to talk to each other. But at this point, there's no um, there's no reason for them to know of each other. There's the clients are a little bit more smart, um, and that may be filling the gap of what you think the reason may be why they need to know about each other. All right. I, I was thinking, again, if you, if you can certainly use it, it's generic. It doesn't have to be anything like the web or interactive, interactive application. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not. So I was thinking, you know, if you have N number, you mentioned LDAP before, you have N number of LDAP servers scattered around because you have a lot of authentication and lookups going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And some of them for failover, some of them for load balancing, but not one server gets hit with everything. <coughs> You have all these clients that are looking things up or authenticating mm -hmm. to get to n number of web uh, LDAP servers to get the information back. You can put this in the middle, and then it just you have more. You have both failover and load balance. Mm -hmm. you, you said you don't have job over .net client interfaces yet. There, there is a job interface, um, and I actually have a, a student group. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and um, I'm working with a student group at Portland State University. Um, and they're implementing a JMS interface too. So if you're using the API for JMS for something, you'll be able to, you know, drop your IBM provider and drop in like a, a Gearman provider for JMS um, at some point. Um, but there is a native job implementation too that looks like the Gearman API. Um, there, it's still under development, but it is functional at this point. Yeah. So I have exactly the kidney problem. Only instead of pictures of kittens, I have x-rays. Okay. Of kittens? And Super. <laughs> <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I don't have a lot of servers to play with. I okay. have a couple. So what is the minimum number of machines where it actually makes sense to use Gearman instead of just keeping everything on just one machine? Yeah. It, like I said, it entirely depends on the application. Um, for prototyping, you can do all this on a single machine. Um, if you're trying to push your image processing off, like just as many as machines you can afford um, as your workers, and then you can run your clients and, um, and the job servers anywhere, really. Like they can be running on the same machine as some of the workers or clients. So. Right. So what I was thinking of is having a worker on my main web server and then a fallback machine as a, you know, a secondary worker in case that one gets too busy. Yep. That, uh, yeah, sense? I mean, if, if you have a spare machine that isn't being used that could be, I, you can start a worker on, I mean, if, if you have a laptop plugged in for five minutes, you could start a worker up and have it connect and do, you know, offload that much more load. Um, one of your office workers' machines. <laughs> do you know if anyone um, considers a problem of, you don't have, you don't actually own the so you want to launch, launch, you know, workers on machines that you create when the demand gets high enough. Yeah, this is actually one, um, one of the things we're looking at doing, and probably you'll be looking more at this. Do you want to talk about it a bit more? Awesome! It could be a botnet gearman revolution. <laughs> you don't even need to, you don't even need to do a rootkit, right? Just to install a gearman on it. That's right. It's different workers. Who needs IRCs, IRC bots? You can have gearman bots, right? So like like Amazon web pages uh, and you know VMs and like Rackspace VMs like that's an obvious place where that's you know that's one of the things my company is looking at doing <laughs> is being able to flexibly scale out whatever you need to do a number of things not just gear and memcached anything and that's the whole beauty of doing things in the cloud is that you have these machines that aren't really <coughs> machines there. Yeah. So which company do you work? Doesn't have to be. North scale. So, you know, one's that available. Oh, you have to I, I should use it. No. <laughs> well, well, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. We're, we're, we're working on the monitoring systems that will enable that, like, automated startup of VM, startups and Gearman workers, <coughs> um, without you ever having to log in or touch a console interface. That's one of the things that we're working towards, and you'll probably be working on a lot more of them. <laughs> Yeah, that was just the maybe you too. thing that I was going to say. The problem is, Gearman would be great, but you already have to have the resource there and allocated. At, currently, with that worker running, 
Yeah, <coughs> but it would be nice if the other work could automate itself to turn itself on or get that allocated for a Well, the worker is yeah. blocking when it's not busy. So it's basically stalled. Yeah, you're still paying for the service from uh, your cloud. You know, you, it's not doing anything, but you're you still paying for that down. For that so you're oh, still I sitting. Well, oh, if you've okay. got low load, you can use auto scaling and EC2 to kind of take down the number of workers that you have. And then when the load starts to get up, you set the rules. It will start spawning <coughs> in instances, and new servers will be there. And they'll register themselves with the um, job thing, and off you go. So you only, with that or with right scale in one of those environments, you're only, it has more dynamic scale so that during peak load in a certain in a given day, you could be running 500 machines and then overnight be running five. So you're not paying for them all month, you're just paying <coughs> for them when you need them. Is it possible to set up it, set it up in a multi-level kind of way, where yeah. like workers wrap around some lower level jobs? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, a map produced example. Um, it's a good segue of, so they created this to process all the kittens. Um, <laughs> what else can you do with it? Um, because they started seeing, like you guys have been talking about, wow, we can actually use this for other uses. And it's a queuing system, <coughs> as well as a job distribution system. Uh, so a multi-tiered approach, if you want to do MapReduce like ability, you could have a client submit some big task to be done, and an intermediate worker could pick that task up, um, do the map, you know, break it up into smaller chunks, distribute that to, um, basically you have an embedded multi-client inside of the worker that starts up, you know, X number of workers at the second tier, and they do, you know, the work, and then this intermediate worker does the re reduction of you know all the results coming back like either a summary or some distributed merge sort algorithm and sends one consistent you know result back to the client and obviously you could have this worker be that again and you know you can create this whole tree of you know processing if you're um, I actually talked to some guys at uh, the Stanford linear accelerator and how they could use something like gearman um, to process uh, they're making a movie of the sky um, of the night sky with this giant telescope. It's like, um, what's it, like 10, 10 gigapixel camera that they have in Argentina. And they're going to take a picture of the sky and, or make a movie of the sky over the course of 10 years. And they're going to have some insane amount of data they're collecting. And they need some like multi tier approach to process all the data and you know create summaries at the top level. And um, I was explaining basically this architecture that expanded a few more levels. Um, to look at different parts of the sky and drill down to specific stars and that sort of thing. Now, why wouldn't they use MPI for that? I mean, isn't that what message, message passing interfaces for? Yeah, they're. Uh, or is it too complicated <coughs> for what they I know they're evaluating do? that one too. They, they've sort of contacted a number of open. They want to do it all open source. And they actually have their own in house database that they're working on with some of the big database guys. Um, they've looked at um, a well, number of. Is free. Just in pitches right off the shelf free. Yeah, from the PR is free. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I know they're looking at other things, and the, I'm sure they did look at those. They're just sort of talking to everyone to you know get ideas. Well, this is simpler. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is simpler and easier to manage than than MPI. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that was one of the goals is to make it really simple to use, like you know, three lines of code, and you have an application running pretty much. Um, I'm going to sort of breeze through this, but by taking that log processing example, or the MapReduce example, and applying it to something like Apache logs, you know, you have 100 web servers, and they all have their own um, <coughs> logs. You either want to scan all those logs at the same time in a nice interface, or you want to just push all those logs to some logging cluster in the middle, and then query out of that logging cluster um, that could possibly par be partitioned in another way as well. So you can. Um, you know, pushing, like I said, the storage off to other nodes, um, pushing the processing to where the data is rather than like pulling the whole log file down and processing it on another machine, freeing up, you know, you don't want to create more load on your web server that's already busy. Like, say, if you're hitting some load issue, you don't want to start processing logs on that because you're just going to make it more busy, and, um, you know, make the problem worse. And then get some type of, you know, useful result out of that <coughs> um, or out of the result. So to collect these, you can do something as simple as 
tail-f your access log and pipe it into the gear man command line tool. And that'll just start sending um, one job per line out to some gear man job server. And then you can have something <coughs> picking it up while you have information. Um, you can write a custom log entry, which is pretty much the same thing, except running in process or you know, directly from Apache. Or you could write your own Apache logging module if you wanted to. Um, and some of the examples are distributed grep, um, you know, plugging this into something like AW stats, or you know, doing your own click analysis if you want to process lots of data quickly. So ignore the, the bottom half at first, but it's taking um, you know, taking all your Apache nodes up here, shoving all your log entries into a job server, and then your workers can pick up those log entries, um, you know, whatever's free, they pull it, and that gives you some natural partitioning of your logs. <coughs> You can add a second level check in there of like, this just is getting full, shut down my worker, so they start spilling over to the other logs and send an email saying that, you know, do something about me because I'm filling up. Uh, you, so you can automate some of that. And then once you have all your, your access log data thrown into this other cluster, you never have to touch the disk again on those frontline machines to see what's happening in your web server. Um, you know, you, you push your log processing information to another cluster. You can then query that log processing as much as you want without worrying about you know, slowing down your frontline machines. And if you've partitioned that log data, you can do it all in parallel. So if you have a number of workers running um, on this data, you can say you know, the partition of the log file that you have for some string, you know, say if there's like a bad host that you know you've been getting um, you know, spam from, or that there's possibly a bug in some of your code of a certain URL, like grep for that domain, and you know, spit out anything that you uh, found in that log file. And like I said, the, the same thing you could do: uh, take all those log entries, combine them together, you know, merge them back together into one log file view, and pipe that into something like AW Stats. Um, or if you just want to watch your, you know, million pictures, um, you know, on all your Apache log servers at the same time. So it's sort of taking some MapReduce ideas and you know, taking the sharding idea and you know, applying it to something as simple as Apache logs to, to offload that processing. Uh, the other uh, big use that people have been using here for is an asynchronous queue. Um, like one of the most common ones is, you know, you want your website to send an email or something like Twitter. You know, you send an Ajax request to post this on everyone, all my friends' Twitters. You know, you don't want that to block before you send a response back. You just want to dump that on a queue, make sure it gets run, and then return to the user so it looks like a seamless interface. Um, Gearman can act as that uh, asynchronous queue as well. Uh, you know, just like, you know, in-process, uh, you know, synchronization, like, asynchronous queues scale a lot better than, like, new texts. Um, like, when you're, you know, writing C code, you know, if you want to scale between multiple threads, if you have a mutex, you're going to hit um, contention points. If you have asynchronous queues between your threads, you're going to scale a lot better. Um, same thing applies at a higher application level of, you know, if you have some synchronous operation or some large transaction that's blocking, that's not going to scale well, but if you, you know, pushing things around asynchronously, you know, it'll it may be slightly delayed, but the user experience for the most part is going to be much better. Um, uh, one of the things I was originally doing with Gearman is a distributed um, data storage for email. And I developed an entire um, database schema that was actually backed by MySQL or Drizzle, in which case when you send an email, um, it would be replicated three times. And then say if you sent like a, you know, rename the folder that this email went into, you know, making sure that the order of those events didn't matter. Like in the, at the end of the day, once all those events were processed, um, you had the same consistent view for all users, um, regarded of, or regardless of which, uh, you know, replication um, server that you have. So, like I was mentioning before, those data models need to be what you know people have been calling eventually consistent. Um, and there, there's uh, the Amazon guy, uh, Vogels, he wrote a whole paper on eventually consistent data models. That's a pretty decent read. Um, and there's a theorem of you can either have consistency, um, availability, or you know. Uh, network partitions, like resistance to network partitions, and you can only choose two. So eventually consistent means you choose always to be available and be able to handle network partitions. So if you have one server down, it doesn't take your entire cluster down, um, because that's pretty much how things need to scale nowadays. 
um, which means consistency for most applications, you can make the eventually consistent model work. Um, so you're throwing away the C, but you still have E C as the idea. Do you have a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. like in the cases of a physical catastrophe, <coughs> when you say a server goes down, let's say, is it, let's say mechanically, or by like fire it, or blood? In which case it will never come back up. Right. Yeah. So, <coughs> so in that case, you're you're looking at, um, you know, you need replication in there, like geographic replication, preferably. So if you lose California due to an earthquake, you still have a copy in Boston that can c continue running. Um, and you don't need some synchronous transaction between the two. Like, you can just push into their queues and everything will be uh, ironed out at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, not necessarily the end of the day, but like, you know, when all those events get processed, you'll end up with the same view whether you're looking at California or Boston. Um, but that way, when you write something into Boston, you don't need to make sure it happens at the same time at both sites. And then, you know, it's identical that way. You can say, here's an event, here's an event, and they are applied in different order at different sites. But when both are applied in opposite order, you're going to have the same view or the same set of data after that. Or and that's the idea of being eventually consistent. Or you can say that at particular time, uh, it is almost consistent. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of like, um, you know, quantum physics, like, mm -hmm. things fall into place when you view it, not when you, um, you know, there's not like some absolute view that's always consistent. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, taking, uh, you know, that, that's one way, you know, when you're, especially when you're dealing with data storage through Caraman, is you're looking at those types of asynchronous queues. Um, and another way you can use asynchronous queues are just simple background tasks. Like I said, you know, send all these tweets from Twitter into a queue and make sure they get delivered at some point. Um, and that's like a, you know, a Gearman background task um, in Gearman terminology. One of those applications is Narada, which Patrick will talk a little bit more about here in a second. Um, real quick to wrap up, the, the core Gearman stuff is We've added HTTP support, so you can actually make an HTTP request directly to the Gearman job server, and it'll get done by a worker. Um, <coughs> we're adding memcached support, and going to be doing some interesting things with caching within the job server. Um, there's hopefully going to be XMPP support too, because XMPP maps pretty well into Gearman. Uh, another big question is security. If you're starting pushing Gearman jobs over the internet, and it's you know sensitive data. We're going to have, you know, TLS, SSL3 support and SASL authentication pretty soon. Um, and we also want to add multi-tenancy so you can have independent users on the same job server, not, you know, with their own function namespace. So if Patrick has a site and I have a site and we both want a resize function doing different things, we're not going to be mixing up our workers. You can use the same job server. This is going to be useful in, um, like, hosted environments where you could have, you know, multiple people using Gearman. Uh, replication between job servers, this is for like geographic replication, um, more language interfaces, uh, and also being able to pull more stats out of the job server to make decisions on your load. So you can see, you can get some basic stats out like how many workers are connected, how many jobs are in the queue, and how many jobs are running. But being able to pull things like, what's the average runtime for this function? Um, and things like that. We're collecting a lot of that in the server already. We just don't have an interface to pull it out yet. But we're we're adding um, some of that stuff in now. And also event notification hooks for things like debugging. So you can say um, you can register something into the job server that says give me all the failed jobs, like maybe the payload of that job too. So you can monitor all your Gearman job servers, and every time a bad job goes through, you can um, have like a debugging server picking that up and logging it, and you can go review that later and say, hey, these five jobs failed. You know, I need to, you know, go fix my bug. And like I mentioned, the, that monitor service to do your sort of elastic, um, you know, management of servers. So we have a website. We're on IRC. Um, there's a a group on Google that you can join. It's a fairly low mailing list, you know, a few mail, emails a day. And again, we're going to be at OSCON. We have a three-hour tutorial going into a lot more details of, you know, how some of this works, especially the concurrent task interface and the advanced worker interface. And 
um, some of the job server features that we've been adding lately. Then we also have pretty much this talk is going to be given again um, as a 45 minute session. And uh, we'll have a talk at night and an uh, exit call booth as well. Is anyone here going to Oscon? Well, this idea. <laughs> Hopefully. If you are interested in going to Oscon, you can still find like really, um, if you go onto their Twitter feed, you can find like 40% off discount codes. So, and depending on where you work for, sometimes they'll pay for you too. Um, you want to talk about Narada? Yes, Narada. Narada is a, um, an idea, a concept that I came up with when I was writing my book. I wanted to show what you could do with Gearman. One of those, I, one of the ideas I had was, wouldn't it be neat to have a storage engine where I put some of the tasks that I'd normally have inside of the web application and have workers do it? Uh, functions such as uh, something that causes the indexer to run, something that uh, I'm trying to think of all the different workers that we have. We have an indexer. We have we have something that. Uh, Fetch worker? Yeah, we have a fetch worker. The idea was, I first came up with, you'd have a fetch worker. So you'd have this queue that your web application would maintain. You go in there and you type in a URL. And then that would uh, go in a table. In, this, in the first version, I had a trigger on the table. The trigger would call a Gearman UDF, which they'd then call a fetcher worker. The fetcher worker would go out and fetch the content of that URL. And it would, uh, in addition to fetching the content of the URL, it would also parse out the URLs within that URL and put them yet in another table that would have other triggers that would, uh, in turn, uh, call the fetch worker on those. It would also store the content of what it fetched inside of memcached. And it would insert into a table saying what the key in memcached was, which in turn called another worker, which took it from memcached and stored it in the database. And after so many inserts, it would call, call an insert worker, an indexer worker. And the indexer worker would say, oh, we've, we've had you know, a certain number of inserts, time to re-index Sphinx. Um, and those were the three primary uh, workers that I did with this. And then you have a search worker that can query that data back up. Yeah, that's one that we've added recently. Because yeah. originally the search, I didn't have a search worker. I just had it built into the application. but it. We thought about it, and it made sense. Why not just have a search worker? Something that you call with a certain query, and then it returns in some format that you can then parse, such as JSON, and uh, display that in your simple index page, search page. So it's taking a basically a, a full text um, search engine um, that crawls websites and URLs, and creating it as a series of asynchronous queues. Um, so you can sort of easily scale out just by firing up more, um, more workers for databases, full text indexers, um, or, uh, or the search workers themselves doing it. And just create as many machines and gearman workers as needed to, to handle the load. Yeah, and you could, uh, like he has optional to use memcache, that's another worker that we need to re-add back in there. Because we, we thought, originally I had it you know, pull the content from whatever URL it was retrieving content from and put it in memcached. And then another worker would copy it from memcached to the database. But there's really no need for that. What, what would be more useful with memcached is that whenever there's a search done, put the results of that search in memcached. So any subsequent searches on that particular term that might return that um, particular record would then be in memcached. And instead of querying the database with the IDs that you get from Sphinx. Sphinx gives you the IDs of a certain term that you search for, and they map to whatever the primary key is in that table. But instead, we have this key. Oh, we don't have to go to MySQL. Let's pull it out of memcache. So you have an extremely fast search index with Sphinx, and then you can get the actual contact con content of what you're searching for from memcache. So it would be extremely fast. Instead of ever touching the database, I mean, right now, the common paradigm is you have a MySQL database and use full text, and full text is painfully you know, slow to update because you have to update you know, this huge index the more records you get. Yeah, one of the, the key pieces of this is this uh, 
you, there's a little feedback loop right here but between the insert and the fetch worker. The insert says, here, um, you know, go fetch this URL. And the fetch worker, um, like Patrick said, it grabs the URL, extracts all the other URLs out of that page, and puts them back into the insert worker. So you end up having this loop where they can, um, you know, you, you can crawl either an entire website or, or crawl multiple websites, say only you go three recursion levels deep. Or if you don't have any constraints on it, you eventually you would probably hit the entire internet or fill up your disk first. Um, so, so one work like make sure you're using some constraints, or else you're going to max out your bandwidth pretty soon. Um, with this, the beauty, the beauty of Gearman is that you can control a lot of this. Really, you know, in the old paradigm, I'd write you know a piece of Perl code that would do the fetch, and if it found something, it would do a fork, and then so on and so forth. This way, you can kind of control how many workers there are that are, that are available to subsequent fetches of whatever you <coughs> pull out. Yeah. So you, you don't can kind have of to throttle it that way. And with 10,000 processes all trying to fetch a web page, you can just run, you know, 10 workers and you know you're not fetching more than that. Um, yeah, and this, this project help, just helps tie together some of the Gearman and Memcache and MySQL or Drizzle concepts and putting them into a, an application that's sort of designed with asynchronous queues in mind um, rather than, like Patrick was saying, the traditional approach. So. And it, it runs on, uh, you can run it on MySQL or Drizzle. Uh, there's a, a trigger version, a non-trigger version. There's PHP and also Perl now, because it doesn't matter what you write the workers in. Yeah. We didn't. We do have Java workers, but the, there's a, a licensing issue we're trying to work out with the guy who wrote those. Um, so the the link here on the bottom, if you go to launchpad.net/narada, you can actually see the source code for all this. Um, but we're going to give you a quick little demo. So this is the, you know. The default search page. There's not much to it. You can search for a term, or you can submit a URL. Um, and I have a, a website running locally here um, of another organization that I'm involved with. But we're we're indexing all this content in this URL, um, and it'll crawl the various web pages. So if I um, should start up a, a Gearman job server here. Um, then uh, I'll submit a job. Let's call it <coughs> submit this one here. It says it's now indexing that. And what happened is that added when I ran that, this web page um, triggered a Gearman background job to be fired off, and it returned immediately. <coughs> so now um, inside of Gearman D, there's a there's a queue for fetch, or I should say for insert, with this URL inside. Um, there are no workers running yet, so I'm just going to start and stop the workers um, as we go through it. Um, so when I start this insert worker, we have an method call. Yes. Don't ever do live demo. <laughs> yes, the uh, insert worker is going to basically your, your web the the index PHP or whatever you have if it's a mod Perl handler or a Java servlet whatever. That, that is the Gearman client, and it basically talks to the Gearman server. The Gearman server's job is to, to uh, dispatch workers, and so in this case, we're, we're calling the insert worker. And so we give it a URL, the insert worker, then <coughs> inserts that into a, a table. And it also, it in turn is another, is a client, a Gearman client to the fetch worker. And so it calls the fetch worker. It will fetch that URL. <coughs> the fetch worker will. Uh, the PHP version uses um, HTML DOM, I think, and it looks for any links in there, and it in turn takes those links, and calls the insert worker to also fetch those links to uh, insert those URLs and also fetch the content from those URLs. So that's what we're about to show you here. What you got? Let's throw it.
I upgraded the uh, Drizzle PHP module. Uh -huh. um, okay. And I was the developer I working on that changed the function, the method name on me. So I haven't actually run this since I upgraded the PHP module. The PHP module was just released um, last Monday, or actually last Thursday. So when I ran the insert worker here, you can see it, it picked up the URL that we submitted, um, <coughs> uh, source slash northwest edge. Um, now that took it, like Patrick said, and put it in the fetch worker queue. So when we run the fetch worker uh, URL that's already in the database, so I should use I actually already indexed this site. <coughs> I'm going to grab another URL that doesn't exist yet. Not to do that. Try using this URL instead. Um, so I'll submit that. We've inserted that URL now. And this one found a series of local URLs escape issue. Yeah. So the fetch worker, um, oh, let's do this. Uh, I'm sure we can read that. So it's fetching the the URL that we inserted. Um, it just breaks down the, the URL into protocol, domain, and path, and file. Um, so it knows what to look for if it's doing some filtering thing. Only look for URLs within the, within the same domain or, um, or you know, whatever type of filter you want to apply. And we're doing only the same domain. So we've found all these local URLs, which are going to index. But we're skipping the Facebook and Twitter URL, because they point somewhere else. Um, then at the very end, we hit a, another escape call with a change method name. So And when we fetched the document, we found the title. Um, we can restore that along with the document that we're storing to make sure we're, you know, we have something nice to display. And at this point, the document has been fetched. All the new URLs have been, have been pushed into the insert worker queue. And the document was stored inside of, um, stored inside of the database. Right. Big text field for the actual content of the page. So now what we can do is start up the uh, the Sphinx search engine. Um, it runs as a demon in the background that you can. I don't know how many of you know about Sphinx. Sphinx is a, for those of you who don't know about it. Um, full text indexing in MySQL is a built-in index. You you create the full text index on a particular column. So you have a blob column called content you know, website. And the full text index automatically creates the index, and you can run search queries on that. With Sphinx, it's, uh, not, it's not built into MySQL. It's decoupled into its own server. But you also have the ability to set up Sphinx to say, this is the MySQL server I want you to hook to, and this is the query I want you to run. And it runs the query in the database for all the records using the primary key indexing with that primary key and it creates an index within itself. So everything that you have in Sphinx that is indexed has is by the ID that it is in the database. So you run the query on Sphinx and it returns back whatever IDs you want for that search term and then you obtain the data from MySQL or Drizzle with that ID. <coughs> so you're, it's a very fast query. It's not like doing this really slow full text search in MySQL. Um, and if you have some other s storage method, say some, something like memcache, and you use the primary key value um, as the key in memcache, you can just retrieve it from memcache if you want. So it makes it really fast that way. But the beauty of Sphinx is that you're not constantly, a with a full text index, anytime you update or insert into that table, it also updates and insert you know, that index. So it can be really slow, particularly if you get a ton of data. With Sphinx, you don't have to worry about it slowing down the actual database. And rebuilding the index 
in Sphinx is much faster. You, you can actually do it in iterations too. Um, you can build a smaller index, um, and every time you do a search, it'll search the larger and the smaller. And at some point, you can fold that smaller one into the larger one. I thought if you add to the no, not not randomly, but to the end of the text, it doesn't have to rehash the whole index. It only needs to index the adding added part, so it is not so slow. With MySQL full text? Yeah, I, I don't know. I I've had. My, one of the jobs I it depends on, on how you how you add those things. Yeah, I, I you know I, I used to work at this one company and we had maybe two million records of feed <coughs> RSS data, and we used to get replication lags that would be like 15 minutes, and part of that was that it was my ISAM and you know we were doing these inserts and mm -hmm. so you get yeah, table level locked, locks, yeah. but yeah. even even as I know DB it was still slow and it would lag, but we couldn't switch to InnoDB because Full text only runs on right, my ISAM, my so same, yeah. you were stuck. Not only were you my ISAM and you're inserting all this data, but uh, you're using full text. When we went to InnoDB and used Sphinx, mm -hmm. replication lag just was gone. You never had that problem again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Sphinx adds a lot of uh, a lot better support into the documents that you're indexing. It um, it was written guy by who's Rus who's Russian, so he knows character sets and the pains of working with different character sets really well, um, and you know what it is to you know have word breaks that aren't necessarily spaces. Um, so he he's really uh, he really took all that in, into consideration, and he also um, provided the the ability to support much more complex queries than MySQL full text does mm -hmm. um, with some of the, the operations, um, you know, with the various keywords. So, like, MySQL provides, like, this, you know, the common set, but, you know, with Sphinx you can do much more complicated uh, full text queries. And its ordering is really fast and grouping. Mm -hmm. So you can use the, the ordered results from Sphinx and glue your results back together your application and get much faster. You can, in many cases, eliminate things like file sorts or if you have some a lot of data that you're grouping. There even is a Sphinx uh, storage engine where you, it's kind of it makes it more closely coupled, so you can use the you can use the Sphinx's ordering and the results that you get back will be ordered, but not through MySQL because mm -hmm. of what Sphinx did. Um, the other beauty is that you can have multiple Sphinx servers, so you can have mm -hmm. you know. You can shard your data, and you can have multiple index servers and use a distributed index to put it all together. And that, that can really... Well, if you have multiple CPU machine, yes. it works well. Yeah. yeah, and you can run multiple uh, Sphinx agents on the same box. So you can shard it in any number of ways. So we, we have Sphinx all configured to look at a database um, with all those documents we just pushed into it. And there's actually a worker written to automatically re-index it. But since we just pushed in one URL, we're going to run this manually. This is what the worker would have done. Yeah, the, the worker basically just runs this command every X number of documents you insert. It's the simplest um, worker in the world. So we, we have the, the Sphinx search daemon running. And then we run the indexer. Um, uh, and this will. Uh, <coughs> Re-index all index we specified in the config file, and then um, and then rotate them with the, the search D that's running in the background. Um, and we can see we sort of found uh, one new document. Um, I don't think it, it says the difference really. It just says all the total documents. Yeah. But we were able to we found 29 documents and. Um, in the real world, point. what you do is you have one big. You can have one big index, mm -hmm. and then. You know, if you re-index a content, you can use a delta index, and then late at night you would merge. You, there's an index merge that you would run. Where you'd merge that delta in with the, the main, and then your index goes back to, to a small index. So, so yeah, this this actually, I think we are using the the delta index here. So we have a main index and a delta one. Um, and then a distributed index basically serves both of those. Yeah, it sort of combines those two indexes into one one big index. Um, and returns your result sets as if it looked like one big index. And then I ran the uh, the search worker, um, which we saw in, in you know the, sort of the last step to query the database and the and the Sphinx full text index. So now when you you know put something into the the new search, say if I search for news, um, 
down here we can say uh, we can see 19 documents match the the name news, and these are uh, Patrick just added um, the excerpt support, so it's pulling uh, small excerpts out of the documents that that actually match this. The Sphinx client API provides you a means of where you pull give it all of the content that you know you retrieve by getting the document ID from that search, and then you pass it the content, and with the actual search term you were looking for, and it takes that content and it creates a nice excerpt. And you can have the excerpt um, uh, print out the keyword as bold or with you know whatever you want, the EM tag. And what the search worker is doing is it's returning a result set in JSON, and then the PHP is you know re uh, turning the, the, the serialized data into a PHP object, printing it out. It can be done in any language you like. So I ran another search, and um, you can see the the search worker. What it does is, you know, calls Sphinx and says, "How many documents match the the term East Side?" And then how many documents? Um, it pulls that document list back, and then queries. In this case, I'm running Drizzle over here in this other window. Um, pulls those documents out, and then builds the excerpts. So. But if you had popular search terms and you were sticking it in memcached, you could end up having most of these, you know, most of these searches pulling the actual content out of memcached instead of the database, which would be even faster. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, you had, you know, Michael Jackson cached. You wouldn't have had the internet meltdown or some new large news sites meltdown like it did. Um, so yeah, that's it's a it's a fairly simple example, you know, showing how some of these technologies can be put together into, you know. Basically, lots of asynchronous queues, you know, pushing the data back and forth and, and directing what, you know, what worker should be running next. Um, it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg uh, device, as I call it. Any questions on this example? Well, I guess that's it.